Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's Premier Pulse virtual session on faba beans. These virtual sessions are new for SPG and our opportunity to take our winter extension meetings online. My name is Corey Leeson. I'm a director with Saskatchewan Pulse Growers, and my wife and son and I farm at Radisson, Saskatchewan, and I'll be your host for today. We'll be hosting a live question and answer session with an agronomist panel and our speakers at the end of the presentations. So if you have questions, please type them into the question box on your go-to webinar control panel and we'll answer them in the, in the question and answer period. I wanted to draw your attention to a survey that's currently going on and looking for some feedback on fab, from faba bean growers. Pulse Canada is assessing the environmental impact of faba bean production to try and help position them as a low uh, environmental footprint food and they need some grower input for that survey so after today's session you'll receive an, in, an email uh, linking you to that survey and if you just take the time to to help provide some some input to that it would be appreciated I want to thank today's sponsor Faba Canada thank you again to Faba Canada for your sponsorship today first I'd like to call on Dr. Constance Shramba Pulse Science Cluster Program Manager with SPG for some welcome remarks before we start the sessions today. Good morning and welcome, Constance. Good morning, Corey, and thank you for the introduction. Developing new crop options with the goal of at least one viable pass crop for every arable acre of land in Saskatchewan is one of SPG's key strategic result areas. To ensure pulses are a profitable and sustainable option for all growers in Saskatchewan, we believe that fostering adoption of minor crops like faba beans is key to achieving this goal. SPG is supporting these efforts for faba beans through a number of strategies and investments. And I wanted to highlight just a few of the things SPG is doing specifically related to faba beans today. SPG has recently refreshed our research and development strategy, which guides the work and investments we make in research, and now includes a more intentional focus on the biggest issues for growers. In the shorter term, we're focusing on getting the right genetics grown in the right places around the province and determining and communicating the best economic practices for Saskatchewan pulse, pulses with an emphasis on weeds, disease, fertility, seeding rates, rotations, and harvesting time. We have and continue to invest in fiber bean research in order to better adapt faba beans to Saskatchewan growing conditions. SPG has invested over $675,000 in faba bean breeding between 2017 and 2021 for the development of adapting of adapted high yielding faba beans for Saskatchewan at the Crop Development Centre at the University of Saskatchewan. SPG has also invested over $175,000, which was leveraged to a total of $430,000 in faba bean agronomy research projects, including investigating the epidemiology of chocolate spot in faba bean, wrapping up this month, and the epidemiology of, faba, of different foliar faba bean pathogens in Saskatchewan, a new project to run through to 2024. Faba beans are also part of $2 million with science project that SPG funds looking to provide a robust strategy for long-term weed management in pulse crops, which runs through 2022. On the processing and utilization side of things, SPG has invested over $600,000, which was leveraged to a total of $2 million towards projects, including strategic approaches for fiber bean value addition and utilization, increasing faba bean use in pet food and aquaculture feeds, and salvage values of damaged faba forage and faba bean in ruminant livestock systems. These are projects are ongoing through to March 2023. We know that we cannot simply produce more faba beans. It is also essential we develop and diversify global markets and end use opportunities in order to keep Saskatchewan growers profitable. The Canadian pulse industry led by Pulse Canada has a market development goal to diversify 25% of Canadian pulses to new uses and new markets by 2025. Faba beans have a renewed focus as part of this national strategy, with the focus on outreach to the ingredient processing and food manufacturing industries 
to expand the use of faba beans and faba bean ingredients used in food and feed in North America. We envision a long-term opportunity for expanded use of faba bean and faba bean ingredients in human food consumption, which will require transition to developing and producing low vicin, corn vicin faba beans over time, but should set up Saskatchewan producers for higher value and higher volume marketing opportunities. As we kick off our Premier Pulse virtual series session today, we are thankful for the opportunity to still connect with growers and agronomists virtually this year. We look forward to connecting in person when we're able to do so again, but I'm confident that you'll gain powerful insights on the important topics today to either add or make faba beans more profitable as part of your farming operations. Welcome and enjoy the session today. Back to you, Corey. Thank you, Constance. I think it's great to hear about the transition to low vicine and con low convicine varieties. I think mean, that holds a lot of potential for a real advantage for Sis Saskatchewan and Western Canadian growers. Our first pre presenter this morning is Dr. Shaima Chatterton. She's going to share some of the research she's done on faba bean disease. Um, Shyama's research is important to the overall health and agronomic performance in faba beans. FBG sees this crop as an important part of crop rotations in particular areas of our province. Shyama joined AAFC Lethbridge in July of 2011 as a pulse and special crops pathologist. Her research focuses on management of root and foliar diseases in pulse crops and molecular diagnostics and identification of soil-borne pathogens. She currently leads numerous research projects on pea root rot, white mold of dry beans, chocolate spot of faba beans. We look forward to your presentation, Shaima. Hey, thank you, Corey. So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm here to talk to you this morning about faba bean diseases. Um, this is an exciting opportunity for me. I'm used to talking about root rot, so uh, this was a bit of a, a switch to talk about something else. Um, and so when we talk about faba beans from a plant pathology perspective, uh, we can look at it as either an emergence of a new crop or re-emergence of an old new crop. I know uh, there was some history of faba bean production maybe in the 80s, 90s, kind of fell out of favor, and now we're seeing um, kind of this re-emergence of, of faba bean interest. Um, but I would say we're in the honeymoon phase of this crop where there's still not a lot of acres. Um, because faba beans hadn't been grown for a while, maybe some of the pathogens um, that are unique to faba bean are not yet present, so we can escape a lot of the diseases. Um, and if we do find that, you know, um, particularly with pathogens, the disease pressure hasn't necessarily built up to damaging levels. Uh, with insect pests, I think they're shared a little more between other crops. We might see more insect pests when we start out than we do with disease. But we know that faba beans can get um, a lot of diseases from looking at production worldwide. Um, and pathologists, uh, we're always full of doom and gloom. So, you know, I think we'd say brace yourself, diseases are coming. Uh, and so what we wanted to do, the reason behind this project was to get a handle on what diseases are coming before we maybe see them uh, develop into full-blown full problems. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is a survey for foliar diseases uh, that we've done for the past three years, so from uh, 2017 to 2019. Uh, we did a, a huge part of that project was actually identifying the pathogens that were associated with those foliar diseases. And then I'm going to talk fairly briefly about the management options. And then just because I can't help but talk about it, uh, there'll be a couple slides on, on root rot and, and maybe some um, issues that are developing with vascular wilts. So the foliar disease surveys were conducted in Alberta and Saskatchewan in 2017 and 2018. Um, and here is our disease severity scale on the side here. And you're going to see this come up a lot through the presentation. And basically, we rate from a scale of uh, 0 to 5. Uh, one uh, scale of 1 means completely healthy. And then 5 would be uh, you see complete death of the plant. So the whole um, shoot would be wilted or uh, loss, of, loss of leaves due to foliar diseases. And so here's a heat map across um, Alberta and Saskatchewan for each year. And we can see, uh, you know, we try to target primary, those primary growing regions of faba beans. And we can see that for the most part, we are sitting here kind of in the nice green to blue um, colors. So disease severity was fairly low across all years. 
until we hit 2019 in Alberta. And then we can see that we went up, we're hitting into these red um, levels here, indicating a fair amount of um, disease on the, the shoots, uh, whereas Saskatchewan, we didn't see it kind of uh, reach those levels. And I'll show you um, a graph of that too, so you can see what those numbers actually are. Uh, so just, you know, remember 2017, 2018, not a lot of disease, 2019, a little bit more in Alberta than Saskatchewan. And if we look at the weather patterns across Saskatchewan here for 2017 in blue, 2018 in orange, and 2019 in gray, uh, you can see there weren't, you know, in terms of temperature, pretty standard across all years, mean temperature is kind of 20 degrees and then actually got a little bit cooler in August, uh, likely as the nights become cooler. Uh, and then when we look at rainfall, there was some different patterns, uh, a lot more rainfall in 2019, kind of in early July, uh, whereas 2017 uh, here was quite dry and then we saw a little a blip of rain uh, here in 2018. And then when we look at relative humidity, uh, you know, this is maybe one of the good things about growing crops uh, in the prairies, and especially for these diseases that not need a lot of humidity, we can see humidity generally stayed below 80%. And particularly here, when we're looking at kind of the thababine susceptibility period would be a little bit later into July, into early August. You know, we can see it's below 80, and even by the time we're into August, it's below 70%. So what that means is not great conditions uh, for disease development. Um, and that's really what we saw when we looked at uh, the disease severity across uh, these three years. Um, and we measured it in upper, middle, and lower canopy, uh, generally because diseases, foliar diseases, start in the lower canopy and then move up to the upper canopy um, because there's more moisture in the lower canopy. And so we can certainly see that that was true for disease distribution within the canopy in Saskatchewan in these years that really didn't have high disease pressure. We always saw more disease in the lower canopy and it went lower to the upper canopy. Um, now what's interesting in Alberta, we did not see this pattern in 2019 where we did see that disease pressure was higher because there was much more um, uh, wetter conditions. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? I'm getting a little notification that my network connection is unstable. So far, so good on our end. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so under high disease pressure, we don't necessarily see this kind of movement from lower to upper uh, canopy. Um, and that's what we saw in 2019 in Alberta. So what did we find? Um, now we went into this project really with the presumption that we were looking for chocolate spot. Uh, that's the disease uh, kind of worldwide that is the biggest impact on faba bean production. Um, so when we went, we were starting to see a lot of these different kinds of spots. And you know, this is a learning experience for us as well. <clears throat> and starting to think, okay, well, this is all chocolate spot, just in the different phases of chocolate spot. Well, with everything disease related, I always like to say it's complicated. Um, you know, and after all the issues of working with the root rot complex here, I thought I was going to be working with a nice, simple one disease chocolate spot, and then that's not what happened. Uh, so I'm going to go through and kind of walk you through what these different spots are that we saw and what pathogens cause them. And so here we have kind of our graph, our very complicated graph of the different fungi that we found on all of these uh, leaf samples and from these uh, necrotic spots. Uh, and what we have here is botrytis in the light blue kind of along the bottom here. Uh, and botrytis causes chocolate spots, so we did expect that we would see more botrytis. Uh, the next we have orange here is stemphilium. Uh, we saw it a fair amount in Saskatchewan, kind of increasing from 2017, 2018 up to 2019. Remember 2017 was kind of our driest year and then 2019 was the wetter year. Didn't see as much stemphilium in Alberta until 2019, which is also a very wet year. Gray here is fusarium, uh, very low levels in Saskatchewan, bit higher levels in Alberta, and then we didn't see it at all in 2019. Uh, alternaria here is the yellow bars, and there you can see that that was quite persistent and very common across all years in both Alberta and Saskatchewan. And then these dark blue bars are what we would just call general saprophytes. So there's a large community of fun fungi in the air um, that just kind of hang around. They don't do a lot. They might start feeding on dead tissue if it's there. They help break the dead tissue down, but they're not really pathogens. 
Um, so, you know, we found all these fungi and just highlight again, um, and in uh, 2017 and 2018, Alternaria was the most common in Saskatchewan. In 2019, uh, Stampillium was the most common in Saskatchewan. And then the only time that we really saw a big bump of Botrytis was here in 2019 in Alberta. So I'm going to go through now the next slides and really drill down into these three different fungi, Botrytis, Stemphilium, and Alternaria, and talk about what they're doing in Favabine. So like I said, Botrytis causes chocolate spot, and that I think is was kind of our number one concern. Uh, it's caused by, chocolate spot is caused by two different species of Botrytis, Botrytis fabiae, which is fairly specific to favabine, and Botrytis cinerea, which is actually a very common uh, Botrytis species, and you'll find it on a lot of different crops, but it's not generally considered a major pathogen of any other crops. Uh, it can sometimes be a problem on lentil, uh, sometimes a problem on chickpea, but that's usually taken care of by seed treatments. Uh, the problem with these two species is they're quite difficult to distinguish. The only way you can really tell them apart is by spore size. And here's uh, the larger spores that we see of Botrytis fabiae. And what you can see with both of these species is they produce masses of clusters of these spores, and that's what really gets disease going. But they need very high humidity conditions to be able to produce these spores. Uh, the problem is, is that particularly Botrytis fabiae doesn't actually produce a lot of spores in culture. They like to produce them in the environment, but not in the culture. So we couldn't use that necessarily as a distinguishing, distinguishing feature to tell if we had Botrytis fabiae or Botrytis cinerea. So we have to go to more complicated gene sequencing. And then even with these two species, their genes are very similar. So you have to sequence a whole bunch of genes to be able to tell them apart. Uh, and so what we found of uh, what we could actually figure out was about 53% of the um, isolates that we had collected were Botrytis cinerea, 19% were Botrytis fabiae, 6% are another Botrytis species altogether. But we still have about 23% of these uh, are isolates that we just could not resolve between cinerea and fabiae. Um, the fact that they didn't produce spores in culture would likely mean that they are fabiae, and then that would put our kind of fabiae cinerea um, at sort of equal 50-50 proportions. Um, so that, that's about what we uh, would expect. Uh, I should just mention that generally fabiae is considered the more aggressive of the species in causing chocolate spot. Botrytis cinerea is a bit more of a weak pathogen. Uh, so then what we did, oh, so first we'll just talk about the symptoms. Uh, these are the very classical chocolate spot symptoms on these two leaves at the early stage. So the, the disease has what we call a weak stage and then aggressive stage. So the weak stage, you kind of see these little pinpoint chocolate-like uh, colored lesions all over the leaves. Uh, and then when it moves to the aggressive stage, you'll see the lesions start to coalesce and form uh, much bigger spots. And this is when you would also start to see uh, the pathogen start to sporulate on these spots. But I'll say that we never saw that in the field. And I think it's because, you know, we just didn't have that humidity. Like I said, it, you know, generally stayed below 80, uh, sometimes even 70%. And it needs fairly high humidity to start sporulating. But if they start sporulating and then you just kind of get the cycle going over and over again, and that's how it gets led to this aggressive stage. But for the most part, this is the symptoms that uh, we saw in the field, kind of this early uh, pinpoint lesions. Uh, so then we collected all these isolates, I think about at least 90 isolates of Botrytis. And then so the next question was, well, how aggressive are they? Are we dealing with Cinerea that's aggressive, Fabia that's aggressive, what's the range? Uh, and so here's the kind of the number of isolates that we collected in each year. Um, like I said, a lot of them we couldn't resolve to species, so we just have them listed here as a general species. Um, but what you can see is fairly highly aggressive. So Botrytis fabiae, five, that would be something like this, where it's just completely kind of uh, grown throughout the whole plant and pretty much defoliated the plant. Um, and, you know, Cinerea is maybe a little less aggressive, but when we look at the range of these 20 isolates, we get some that don't cause disease at all and some that can completely kind of obliterate the plant. So a big range um, in aggressiveness. Uh, and here's a picture showing what it looks like if it did start to sporulate. Um, and like I said, we only saw this in the greenhouse under very high humidity conditions. Uh, you can kind of see from this greenhouse here, we kind of have to put them in humidity tents 
in order to get that disease going to that level. And then you can also find symptoms on the seeds and the pods. But again, this was fairly rare in the field. This is from greenhouse inoculations and these really high humidity tents where you can, um, you'll start to get uh, disease kind of all over the pods. Um, so now I'm going to switch over and talk to Stemphilium. I'll talk about Stemphilium blight and we'll kind of bring this all together uh, right at the end. So just as a reminder, um, you know, what we saw for Stemphilium blight in Saskatchewan, fairly low, 7% in 2017, 23% in 2018, and 44% in 2019. And this really matches with those weather conditions where it went from dry, wetter, and then wettest. So you can see that this is a pathogen that really requires moisture. Alberta actually saw much lower numbers in 2017 and 2018, again, because those were very dry years in Alberta, and then in 2019, it was up to 34%. So we can see that numbers here are actually higher than botrytis or chocolate spot, which is what we were kind of expecting to be the major disease. So what does it look like in the field? Well, it can look pretty ugly in the field. Uh, here's some pictures here. And I'll be honest, you know, when we first went in and was doing these surveys, I thought this was chocolate spot in the aggressive phase. Um, you know, I guess we were uh, kind of in that learning experience still. And it's not until we brought it back to the lab and did isolations that we kept on pulling stemphilium out of things that looked like this. Um, but it was very rare. So this one is, is a fairly bad picture, but I'll say it's fairly rare that we actually saw it to this extent. Normally we'd see some leaves like this kind of scattered throughout the plant, but not the whole extent of the plant. Um, and, you know, trying to distinguish the symptoms from botrytis can be a bit tricky. Uh, and generally the, the lesions look a little bit grayer and they look a little bit drier, especially if you're there in the field. Um, they tend to get, kind of get crinkly and dried up um, in the middle. Sometimes they'll kind of, they'll fall out because that leaf material all dries up. Um, and they often start more from the edge and kind of move on in. Whereas with chocolate spot, you would see those dots kind of all over the leaves and then it expands to make bigger lesions. Um, now, so the question is, well, is stemphilium a new pathogen to be worried about? Um, and us pathologists never, like I said, we never like to give simple answers. Uh, so what I'll do is kind of show you um, the results of our pathogenicity tests. So we tested 11 isolates in 2017 and 2018 and eight isolates in 2019. And we can see here that that resulting disease severity was fairly low. So a two and a three, which means that we're looking, it's roughly equal to sort of percent uh, leaf coverage that you see. So we're looking at, you know, maybe 20% lesions on the leaves. When we compare that to botrytis, where we saw a lot of isolates could cause complete kind of death of the plant, it definitely is a weaker pathogen uh, than stemphilium. And then when we look at the range, we see a lot of isolates that were one, so don't cause any disease at all. And then up to about four was the max. So we never saw it just kind of obliterate the plant like botrytis can. And when we look at it in the greenhouse, uh, this is kind of the symptoms that we saw. And it often, so we don't, they did actually, in this case, they weren't as bad as we sometimes saw in the field, but we had to wound the plant in order to get disease going and then you would kind of see these gray lesions um, all over the um, all over the leaves. Now what's interesting is that you know when we look at something like this and my first thought would be chocolate spot and certainly there's all these pinpoint kind of lesions here that would be chocolate spot but when you start testing these larger lesions which I assume were the aggressive phase of chocolate spot you actually can pull you actually are mostly pulling out stemphilium from these lesions. So it seems like there's an association between uh, botrytis and stemphilium. So is a new pathogen to be worried about? Uh, I think yes, but there's also more research that needs to be done to kind of figure out what the exact role is. And I think uh, Dr. Sabina Benitz is, is uh, just starting a new project, as Constance said, and she's going to be looking more in detail at uh, you know, what stemphilium is actually doing. And then we have the same question about alternaria blight. And again, these leaves look ugly in the field and we saw we saw a lot of these again it would be uh, kind of like scattered leaves not a whole plant looking like this but you get these large black lesions uh, can be distinguished from stemphilium because you don't get a nice sort of margin of the lesion you can see it's kind of spreading uh, outward 
And it wasn't most common, like I said, in 2017 and 2018, 54%, 56%, and then 36% in 2019. Um, and you get, you know, le leaves like this. So just look, they kind of completely died away. So is Alternaria a new pathogen to be worried about? And this one's interesting um, because we'd actually done some, whoops, there we go. Um, we had done some previous work surveys in 2015 and 2016. And in 2015, we tested a lot of isolates uh, just because it was coming off of these ugly kind of black lesions. So we tested 28 isolates. But in the greenhouse, they all had very, very low disease severity, 1.8. So that just means that it's going from healthy to maybe starting to see a few little lesions um, on the leaves. And when we look at the range, very low. So causing no disease at all to just causing a little bit of disease. And then in 2017, we only tested two isolates and found similar things. So we didn't actually go on and test more isolates. And what this looks like in the greenhouse is that for the most part, we saw that it was only associated with the wounds. So we'd spray the whole plant, wound one leaf, and you would really only get kind of these ugly black lesions occurring on these wounded areas. And the same here has just expanded a little bit. In very rare cases, we would kind of see it move throughout the whole plant. But uh, pretty small lesions, and they're kind of superficial, like you could almost scrape the, uh, scrape the fungus off. So there's this question of like, what is Alternaria doing? It can look so ugly sometimes in the field, those lesions, but we bring it to the greenhouse and really we don't see much. Um, and then uh, unfortunately our surveys kind of stopped in 2019. Uh, Sherry Lynn went on uh, with trying to kind of figure out, you know, uh, the pathogens that were present and did these surveys in 2020. And what she found was that Stemphilium was present um, on a lot of the, the crops that she looked at in um, kind of mid-July, end of July to early August. And then Botrytis kind of takes over. This is generally when chocolate spot develops, kind of end of July into early August is usually our, the, the uh, most susceptible period. And then we can see here there's Alternaria as well that's always associated with these Botrytis species. So I think what we can, you know, what we're kind of thinking right now, and like I said, Sabina's going to do more work on this, is Stemphilium is a mix of aggressive and saprophytic, so sort of these pathogenic and weakly pathogenic isolates or species uh, that maybe can cause disease on their own, but are also, um, you know, kind of piggybacking on Botrytis. And Alternaria is also most likely acting as secondary pathogens. And we got some really nice pictures of kind of that early stage of infection where we can see these botrytis lesions, and then you get that black of alternaria kind of moving in. Alternaria likes dead tissue, so once there's some, some of these lesions caused by botrytis, it just moves right on in. But they're an issue because they're going to increase disease severity. So if we don't get conditions for botrytis to kind of spread aggressively, you'll get stemphilium and, and alternaria coming in. So what Just, are our management options? Well, the first is to start with clean seed, and generally we recommend less than 10% botrytis infection. Uh, in 2015 and 2016, our project was actually looking at pathogens on the seed. And interestingly, what we found is the same pathogens that we found on the plant. So we got Alternaria, Fusarium species, Stemphilium was actually very low on the seeds, and Botrytis species. And here we can see that Botrytis is over in both 2015 and 2016, Botrytis was over that 10% um, limit. Uh, the issue is there's no C treatments for registered for faba bean. So um, you know, it's important to get your seeds tested and check them for these infection levels uh, so that you know that you're not starting out by introducing uh, Botrytis into the seed. And again, what alternaria, the role alternaria is playing on the seed, I think is still unknown. And if we just look at what that looks like, we played it out all these faba bean seeds, and you can see there's this is Botrytis here. You can see that there's a lot of it on the seed, and then that's Fusarium coming out there. And then just a close up of what Botrytis looks like uh, in culture, and these produces these microsclerotia. Just to remind you, <laughs> we've got about three or four minutes left here. Okay, thank you. So when we look at management options, um, you know, I guess our really our only management option is fungicide sprays. Uh, now, the interesting thing is, is that they are none registered on faba beans specifically for chocolate spot suppression or control. They're almost all registered for white mold, which we um, surprisingly didn't really see that much white mold at all in these surveys. Uh, if you are going to spray fungicides, it's sort of early to mid flowering, especially in these warm and rainy conditions or forecasts. So, you know, in the case of um, 
2019 kind of fell off here, but here in 2019, where we saw this heavy rain, right, sort of mid to late July, this is kind of the susceptible period for Botrytis. So this would be a good time to get fungicide on. And, you know, in 2018, we saw that rain there as well, whereas in 2017, we didn't see that. And then, like I said, this, you know, the relative humidity kind of drops off as well, right when you're in that susceptible period. So it's difficult to know whether to apply fungicides. Um, and then Robin Bonas uh, did some work with fungicide application and did find that they were effective in reducing disease severity, but they didn't increase yield overall. So her question, I asked her about it and she said, well, it was hard to say whether there's an economic return. So still a little unclear on how these diseases that can really look quite ugly sometimes if they are impacting yield or if we just haven't hit that kind of critical disease levels yet. And then the other thing is, is crop rotations. Botrytis survives on crop stubble. Uh, so it's good to, you know, not put faba bean on faba bean or, and rotate every four years so you don't build up that botrytis. Um, but the airborne spores are common and appear to be present continuously. And we kind of looked at spore release um, throughout the, the season. And we can see that it kind of, generally we see it a little bit later in the season. And interestingly, we saw more of it in 2017, which was the dry year. So uh, that was a bit surprising. Okay, so I think I got almost out of time. I'm just gonna pop in and talk really quickly about faba bean and root rots. Uh, the good news is the newer cultivars are resistant to Aphanomyces root rot. So a good option if you're dealing with pea or lentil Aphanomyces infestations in your field. They do have some susceptibility to Fusarium root rots but doesn't appear to be as hard hit as say peas. And we've been growing faba bean and peas kind of side by side in some of our root rot infested sites. And here we can see that, you know, we don't get a lot of these root rot pathogens accumulating on faba bean, particularly at this site that was heavily infested uh, in relation to pea. And then I'm just gonna end off very quickly uh, with something to look for in 2021. And this is something that popped up towards the end of 2020, and of course, it's when we're not out doing surveys anymore because the project had ended, uh, Sherilyn noted some of these, these issues in, um, in faba beans. So I just want to say, keep an eye out, let Sherilyn know, and I'm going to try to get into the lab and do some diagnostics if we see those problems. So thank you. Thank you, Shyama, for sharing your, re your research expertise with us. Now, I've grown faba beans twice, so I think I've enjoyed that honeymoon phase as far as disease goes. Uh, but as you say, no doubt diseases are coming if we if we really get it into the crop rotation. If you have any questions for Shyama, put them in the uh, in the question box, and we'll address them at the end of uh, the presentations today. The next speaker is Laurie Friesen, and today she's going to expand on constants in information about varieties and share some of the latest uh, breeding developments for faba beans. Uh, SPG is interested in seeing expanded acres of faba beans, and that will come primarily through uh, bet new, better varieties with improved genetics and, and traits developed sp specifically for Saskatchewan. Laurie completed an MSc degree in uh, agriculture from the University of Saskatchewan, and she dedicated a large part of her career to canola research in the area of breeding, trait development, biotechnology, and genetic improvement. In 2014, she came to the good side, pulse, pulse crop side, as a research project manager with SPG. And in 2016, she accepted the role of seed program manager, where she handles variety commercialization, as well as coordinating Saskatchewan soybean and pulse crop regional variety trials. Welcome, Laurie. Thank you, Corey. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me today to talk a little bit about faba bean varieties. Uh, as you know, faba beans are still an emerging crop in Saskatchewan, but one that has increasing potential and opportunities, and variety development is ongoing to meet these opportunities. Faba bean acres in Saskatchewan have in been increasing over the last three years, uh, with over 52,000 insured acres in Saskatchewan in 2020. And that's probably a little bit closer to over 65,000 acres, just because not all acres are insured. However, uh, production is still being hampered by early frost, and it's uh, you know going to be interesting to see how many acres are seeded in 2021. And so, one of the breeding objectives is always to get earlier maturity to try and avoid those early frosts. 
majority of acres in Western Canada are seeded to the white flowered low tannin variety Snowbird, as you can see here, which has captured 83% of the acres, uh, both overall in Western Canada as well as in Saskatchewan. Uh, CDC Snowdrop, which was released afterwards, has only captured about 2% of the fava bean acres, and only about 4% are seeded to the tannin colored flower type and with the variety of choice being FB9. And this just shows again the, the breakdown of the, the three main varieties in Saskatchewan. And you can see that when CDC Snowdrop first came out, it did capture a number of acres, but then uh, Snowbird started taking over um, while acres of both Snowdrop and also FB9 decreased. So Snowbird just proved to be a higher yielding variety and therefore took over uh, most of those acres. So the tan and colored flower varieties are mainly exported for human consumption. They are typically a larger seeded type uh, than the low tannin types. Uh, exception to this is CDC SSNS1, which is a small seeded tannin variety, which is produced mainly for bird seed or for forage. As I mentioned, the most commonly grown variety is FB9-4. However, higher yielding varieties are becoming available, such as Fabel. Uh, Fabel right now has uh, registered seed advertised uh, for sale. So there may be maybe some certified seed this year, but probably 2022. So this shows the performance data of the tannin types. So this is uh, representing the long-term means adapted from the 2021 varieties of grain crops. And it shows here Fabel being the uh, Czech variety and the strong variety that does yield considerably higher than the most popular variety FB9. So this is expected to do quite well as seed is available. Uh, this also shows good standability with a lower lodging score than the other varieties. And uh, it also has a, about a medium sized seed. And this variety has the low vicine con vicine trait. There's also a somewhat newer variety, Vertigo, which is showing particularly good yield at 105% versus Fabel. Uh, these are both fairly recent varieties that are marketed by DL Seeds. Um, again, they have fairly large seeds. However, they're still significantly smaller than the popular FB9s, which at 680,000 uh, kernel weight can cause plugging issues at seeding. Despite the higher yield of Vertigo, Fabel is likely to gain momentum again because of the low vicine convicine trait of this variety. In the low tan and white flower types, uh, again, these are used for uh, mainly for the feed market. Uh, the most popular variety, Snowbird, there's lots of seed available, lots advertised. Uh, it was registered in 2005, so it has been out for quite a while. It has been a challenge to beat this variety in terms of its combined traits of yield, maturity, and seed size. There is lots of seed available of this. Um, with, uh, However, there are newer varieties such as CDC 219-16. This should have certified seed in 2022. Um, also DL Rico and DL Tesoro. And there might be some limited certified seed this year, but likely uh, more in 2022. So this is again, the performance data of the low tannin types. As you can see, CDC Snowdrop, which was released in 2012, doesn't compete on a yield basis with Snowbird although it does show good standability and equivalent maturity and a smaller seed size. A more recent release from the Crop Development Center, as I mentioned, 219-16, does have a competitive yield versus Snowbird at 102%. And um, maturity is not bad. It's about two days later than Snowbird, and it has an even smaller seed size. DL Tesoro and DL Rico are the, again the new varieties registered in 2018. Both of these uh, have fairly late maturity, maturing about five to six days later than Snowbird, which is, is a bit problematic. 
Um, DL Rico is also quite a tall variety, which may have a higher tendency to lodge, but uh, um, it's the main advantage of this variety is that it has low vicine convicine. Uh, the Altasaur has a very good yield, but it doesn't have that trait. It's anticipated that many of these varieties will be slowly phased out in favor of the low vicine convicine varieties. Uh, currently, the varieties available or will be available uh, next year, if not this year, include Fabel for the colored flower type and DL Rico for the white flower type. However, new genetics are in development and there should be some improved varieties with this trait over the next few years. Just a reminder, Laurie, we've got about two minutes left here. Okay. Uh, I think Constance already talked about the low vicine convicine trait. Uh, the main challenge with this is that you need isolation distance because it does cross-pollinate and it would be contaminated with the high visine types. However, I mentioned there are some new low visine convisine types on the horizon, and this is just a sneak peek at what might be available in the next few years. And one of these that shows particular promise from the Crop Development Center uh, oh, in two years of of head-to-head -head summary in the regional variety trials yielded 11% higher than Snowbird, uh, just two days later than Snowbird, and again, small seed weight. And in the colored flower types, again, here's another one from the uh, Crop Development Center that yields competitively against uh, uh, Fabel, and has equal maturity and uh, about a 500 uh, seed weight. There are also very promising varieties coming out from DL seeds as well as uh, the KGB Meyer seeds. And uh, Limmergren also has some of these varieties in development. And with that, I'd like to thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity and I look forward to questions later in the uh, webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Lori, for sharing the exciting variety updates uh, for faba beans. Look forward to some new stuff coming out in the, in the fairly near future. Any questions for Lori about varieties, uh, type them into the, uh, into the question box and then we'll address them at the end of the sessions. Our next speaker today is Kara Anand, and she'll be addressing the agronomy of growing faba beans. If you're a first time grower or considering growing them, it's important to to help you with some of the, the tricks that there are, particularly seeding is, was one of the challenges that I had. Kara grew up at Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, and always had a passion for agriculture and helping farmers. She graduated from the College of Agriculture at U of S in 2001, and is a professional agrologist and member of the Saskatchewan Institute of Agrologists. Along with her husband, Wade, Kara owns and manages Agro Consulting, an independent agriculture consulting business. Started in 2008, and Kara leads a team of 12 independent agronomists that provide agronomy support for growers across the entire province. Thanks for joining us this morning, Kara. Well, thank you guys today. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, today, I'm going to spend the next 20 to 25 minutes uh, sharing some information with you about FABA's uh, and my infield experience. Uh, they've been a really good rotational crop. Uh, for us, especially up in northeast Saskatchewan, uh, due to our limitations from disease, in particular phenomyces. Um, and they like water and cool conditions, so that is another something I'm pretty familiar with up in this area. So to start with, uh, I'm going to look at uh, what type of field you should be looking at when you want to be growing favas. Uh, the primary thing that uh, I'm looking for when chatting with my growers is to find a field that's early. Um, as just mentioned in Lori's presentation, these faba bean varieties are, are particularly a longer season variety. So if you can get out there um, as soon as possible, uh, I like to say prior to May 15th up in our neck of the woods here. However, um, the earlier the better that you can get them in due to the long season. 
The next thing to look at is uh, to try to start with the cleanest field as possible. Of course, we all like that for every crop we're going to grow. But uh, FABAs, we have a, a limitation in crop with the amount of uh, herbicides we can use. Uh, so we want to start with a nice clean field, um, one that's not going to cause uh, any competition early with our FABAs. And the next thing to consider is uh, your rotation and any past residual products that you may have used. Uh, typically, uh, we tend to seed our FABAs on a cereal ground. So maybe looking at products like, um, or if you had some fluvocarbazone or a clopyrrolid type product, um, maybe not the best option. So be aware of what uh, herbicides you have used in the past year. So after we've got our field um, and ready to go, we're gonna look at seeding here. So I'm gonna touch on uh, date, size, spacing, uh, some treatments and uh, we'll get going into this. So the ideal seeding rate that we found has worked best um, has been 45 uh, plants per meter squared or four and a half plants per square foot. Um, this is found um, as good, good as far as competition goes throughout the field. Uh, we want to seed them at least a minimum two inch, if not three inch uh, deep. Uh, these faba beans uh, are quite large um, and really they need good water to imbibe them. And what might happen is if we end up seeding them too shallow, they may start to imbibe, maybe they'll end up drying out or rotting in the ground. So we want to make sure that these fabas are a good depth in the soil. Uh, the biggest experience I've had uh, with most of my growers is with 12 inch row spacing. I know there's been some work done uh, with our I Heart uh, South Indian Head uh, looking at different types of row spacing. Um, but as far as competition and plants per square foot with the 12 inch row spacing, we've had uh, good success and luck. Uh, seed size, uh, again, uh, mo majority of experience I've had has been with the snowbirds, um, but I do have a few growers growing the FB94s. Uh, the larger seed in the past has caused concern with metering and some drills. Um, I feel like with the newer drills now, um, maybe with one inch hoses that they have, um, that we're not having as much trouble with metering them. But I think the biggest thing is to just stop and check off. And I tell my growers, make sure you know you check every couple rounds, uh, just to make sure you don't have any plugging concerns. Uh, as I mentioned before, early is the key. Uh, in Northeast Saskatchewan, we don't necessarily get seeding um, any in April, uh, likely that first week of May, but uh, I'd like to have them in the ground before that May 15th. The nice thing with these fabas is they're very similar to peas is the, the growing points below the ground. If an early frost does occur, they will be okay. They will regrow again, um, but we don't want that to be our concern. So uh, hopefully Mother Nature will cooperate on that end. As far as treatment goes, uh, there's some options out there. Uh, as far as looking after some seedling rots and root rots, um, Insure Pulse covers that along with the Trilux Evergoal and the Cruiser Max Vibrance Pulse. Um, on the insect, insect side of things, if you are in an area that has some wireworm concerns or possibly some pea leaf level, uh, the Cruiser Max Vibrance Pulse with the Thiamethoxin and the Trilux Evergoal Shield with the imatocord, uh, we'll look after those or help you out there. So switching gears now a little bit into fertility. Uh, some of the, the biggest advantage of growing faba beans um, up here on some of our heavier soils is that we've got some water holding capacity and they, they're managing a little bit better than what our pea acres uh, were, were doing and in along with the disease as well. So when we're typically looking at applying fertilizer, um, we are looking at in that 35 to 45, um, because of the large seed type, we're able to um, put a little bit more fertilizer down than we would um, uh, maybe our canola or some of our smaller seeded pulse crops. Um, when uh, FABAs are huge users of phosphate as well, so um, nice to put um, a good amount down. Um, always look at your soil type, your soil test results, and uh, then 
work with your agronomist, make your recommendation from there. Same thing with potash. Um, we've got a varied amount of uh, soil test levels as far as potash. We go one way and we've got quite low levels. Um, further south, uh, as in most of the province, higher potash levels. Again, FABAs are high users of potash. Uh, so if your soil test requires that, uh, then uh, the addition of potash is also a good idea. Uh, on the sulfur side of things, um, I'm typically not to usually applying sulfur with my FABAs. I've done some work with some growers uh, and also in some small plots up here looking at the response to additional sulfur, uh, applying with the seed and then also applying at that four to five node stage uh, with some fines, the 210024. And uh, we didn't really see any additional response or yield gain from that application. Of course, with any pulse, we like to apply the proper rhizobial inoculant needed. Um, and the one thing with these FABAs as well is when it comes to emergence, we just need to be very patient. Um, they large seed coming from deep in the ground. Uh, it's minimum, I would say, for 10 days for some starting to pop through that ground and probably upwards of two and a half to three weeks before that crop is nice and even and fully merge, emerged. So now moving on to some herbicide applications. Um, first, I'm gonna look at pre-seed options out there. I haven't listed everything today, but just some of the more common popular ones um, that I've been using with my growers. The group two options out there are Pursuit and Express SG. Um, we've been using Pursuit in cases where we're looking at maybe controlling some flushing volunteer canola. That, um, to be very careful with that option. Uh, moving on to the group 414, Goldwing is a new option that has been added here in the last few years. Um, same thing with Conquer, again, no residual on the Conquer side, um, but a nice option ahead. Uh, some other group 14 options are the Authority, Authority Charge, uh, along with Heat. Uh, typically, um, I'm looking at soils with over 6% organic matter, so authority isn't necessarily a great option uh, in this neck of the woods. Um, usually breaks down before we can get some great use out of it, but definitely in other parts of the province, um, if you're looking for some cleaver control or kosher control, that may be a good fit ahead of time. Uh, it seems like one of my go-tos, although very old chemistry, um, has been edge, uh, especially up here. I've got a lot of group two resistant weeds, hemp nettle, chickweed, cleavers, and it's working well at controlling some flushing weeds. Uh, moving into in-crop products now. Uh, we gained a couple more options here over the last few years, um, but typically my go-to here is using Viper. Uh, the nice thing about Viper, made up of the Solo and the Bassagran, is that uh, we don't have to worry about any residual the following year. So uh, Odyssey, again, a great option. It is a group two, um, and you might get a little bit of flushing control throughout that season. And then some nice options uh, for our grassy weeds with the Clethodim, Quizlefop, and Sethoxidim. So typically, I'm aiming for that three to five node. Uh, just the early weed removal with any crop uh, is key, and uh, that seems to be the ideal timing for application of in-crop. So I'm going to just switch gears for a brief moment. Um, I really wanted to bring up this hail. Uh, last year, um, across the northeast on July 2nd, we had a hailstorm go through. It's about a 120 mile span wide and um, really caused some devastation across lots of crops. And I think as an agronomist, every time you end up coming into some hail or hail situation, you're never quite sure what to do. Seems like there's a heavy response the day or two after of uh, lots of solutions that may fix the problem. Um, but it was really interesting to watch the crop and how it responded. So just wanted to highlight a few things uh, that I gained from experience this past year. Um, my FABAs, as you can see there on the left, were shredded um, various degrees, I guess they had holes in them shredded, bent over every which way. 
And we try, we were trying to decide what we should do with them or how they would respond. Um, the interesting thing you can see on that picture on the left too is uh, almost immediately within the week, they started to rebranch out and shoot again. And um, we ended up with honestly having a second crop of fabas coming through. Um, unfortunately, frost came and we didn't quite get them to finish off, but they did definitely reshoot up and almost caught up to the first crop. I'm going to touch a little bit on disease here. Shyama did an excellent job and went into lots of detail on all the diseases. Um, we here in 2015 faced um, some alternary elate, uh, which looked more devastating. Um, but again, as Shyama alluded to, maybe less of an impact on yields. Um, this past year, the stem phyllium, especially with our hail damaged crop, seemed to take over. Um, Sherry Lynn and I were able to walk some fields and have some experience out there looking at these different diseases and how they were affecting the fabas. I uh, haven't noticed lo a lot of chocolate spot. I've sent samples in over the last uh, four to five years, but again, um, it seems to be that the alternary and the symphilium are the more prevalent diseases. When it comes to fungicides, um, we've tried a few different things. Um, we've done, looked at the group three option of the Pryaxer. Again, um, not necessarily having any ascochyta or mold, but just seeing how they may respond, especially when in some cases it, they do look pretty bad, but again, is it yield impacting? Um, Miravis Neo, again, is another option I'd like to look at this year just to see what kind of response, try some strip trials out there and see what we can see. Um, and the timing we're aiming for usually is that uh, mid flower, not quite as early as I would uh, apply fungicide and peas, but in that mid flower range. Uh, as far as insects go, there's three insects that I've had uh, the pleasure, I guess, of looking at or working with in my favas. Uh, pea leaf weevil, uh, just really seeing only that one cycle per year. Uh, we aren't uh, having big populations of pea leaf weevil in uh, spring in northeast Saskatchewan, um, but it seems like kind of in that late July, first part of August, we're seeing some uh, adults emerge. Um, but once again, um, if you have, if they are a concern in your area, uh, there is some options to treat your seed early um, and prevent them from chewing on any nodules or, or causing any damage to leaves. Uh, one of the biggest uh, concerns I have for my growers uh, when I'm telling them to grow faba beans is to be aware of ligus. Uh, we're in an area up here with lots of canola, lots of alfalfa, and just lots of host crops for ligus. And the fabas seem to also get their fair share. So unfortunately, there's no economic threshold determined for ligus and fabas. I believe there's been some work done out of Alberta doing different timings and staging um, and applications. Um, but the biggest concern is that um, if you have uh, more than 1% damage, uh, that they're going to be downgraded, and especially those ones, those fabas that are going for the human consumption market. This is a, a bug that I'm curious about and that I want to learn more about here as we go forward into 2021. Uh, P aphids, um, the highest numbers that I'm seeing with our P aphids, um, especially this past year, um, have been in that mid-August. I feel it's quite alarming and concerning anytime I can do one 180 degree sweep and get one to two cups of anything, let alone a bunch of P aphids. Uh, unfortunately, my crop, it was hailed this past year, but I think um, we need to pay attention to these. They are basically sucking that plant sap out, um, but they seem to be kind of appearing or going to that faba crop as other areas or other crops in the area uh, dry down. Again, there's no established thresholds for fabas, um, so just another insect to monitor. I'm, I'm going to switch gears again here and uh, talk a little bit about pre-harvesting. 
So we've kind of come now to the end of August or first bit of September and our faba beans are starting to turn black in color. So usually you see those bottom pods first starting to appear. The picture here in the top right hand corner um, is what we're kind of aiming for for those bottom pods. The middle pods here um, will have some brown on them, maybe some black, and then the top pods quite green. So in this lower left-hand corner here, the picture, this is uh, for glyphosate timing uh, pre-harvest. This is what I would like the seeds to look for or what we're aiming for. So again, those bottom seeds and the black pods are very hard, very firm. All the middle seeds are still easily splittable, um, but really no juice left in them and starting to change color. And then the top pods, again, no juice left in them, um, but they may not be uh, that fully brown color that we're used to seeing. So uh, Reglone is also registered and uh, can be used as an option. Again, if we're going to use Reglone, we need to go about likely five to seven days, maybe 10 days later, depending on the weather uh, at that time of year before we're ready to spray Reglone. The biggest thing when it comes down to pre-harvest is to have patience again. Um, you may see those bottom pods turn black, you know, even the third week of August. However, it sometimes can take up to another three weeks before those that crop is ready to pre-harvest. So take your time there. Uh, looking at yield, um, We've had really all over the board, in my experience here over the last six or seven years growing fabas, we've had uh, this past year, uh, maybe some 20 bushel uh, yield with the hail. Uh, and then honestly, the year before, probably our best ever record yield at 110 bushels. Um, but I'd say on average, we're in that 50, 60, 70 bushel range. So they're definitely a good option. Um, just need to make sure we get some cooperation from mother nature. Another point I wanted to mention is that um, what we're seeing in year two, so maybe not the year following, but the second year after, we're seeing a, a good amount of residual nitrogen release. So I'm not sure if this is just due to the mass of plant mass, it's just taking a little longer to break down. However, um, the residual um, is definitely a benefit in that second year after. So I just want to focus on some highlights here. Um, the big take home message I would say if you're a first time grower or um, a grower that's grown them for the last few years is to seed early. Um, as Laurie mentioned, you know, we've got very, uh, some good varieties out there, but they're long season. Uh, we need to get them in the ground as soon as we can. I think there's a huge, enormous opportunity to grow these if we can just get uh, them just maturing just slightly earlier, uh, some slightly earlier varieties, um, or we just need a little cooperation on that September end when our frost comes. Early weed removal is key. Uh, I think we've got lots of great pre-seed options out there, uh, finding that clean field. Um, but I think they're, if they're properly managed, uh, I think um, they'll do fine. And really, ultimately, uh, I'd like monitor, but don't panic. Um, there's so many things that we're learning about, so many new things that seems like every year, uh, whether it's a different insect that comes, uh, learning and understanding how these diseases are playing. Uh, hail threw a, a curveball at me this year. Um, and then also on the pre-harvest timing. So just really be patient uh, when you're growing them and don't panic uh, and really um, the hopefully good results will turn for you. So thank you again. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to talk about Fabas today um, and uh, hope you enjoyed that and back to you, Corey. Thanks, Kara, for sharing your agronomy expertise with us. It is a fun crop, and I can vouch on the on the second year end release. Like the best wheat crop we've ever grown on our farm was on faba bean stubble. So uh, there's there's really something to that uh, for sure. So our next set of presenters are going to share with us uh, experience in the faba bean market development area. We've we've been talking about how faba beans 
who have a fit, certainly from a production standpoint and, and an excellent fit in rotation. But we're, we're also, SPG is also working hard on market development for fava beans. It's an important area and we're, we're funding initiatives uh, in our province, but also with, uh, with Pulse Canada uh, to, with, within a national market development strategy for this crop. So I'd like to introduce today's presenters. We have three, three presenters for you. Haley Jeffries is president and co-founder of Prairie Faba. Uh, Haley established Prairie Faba to act as the link between faba bean growers and food processing and manufacturing companies, as well as consumers. We also have Brad Gowdy, who has established Faba Bean Canada Limited in 2018 and has been working towards developing large scale fractionation of faba beans. Faba Canada has added a processing and export facility at Sturgeon County, Alberta, where they will be exporting whole faba beans for food and feed markets and fractionating faba beans into plant based, plant -based protein. And we also have Kyle Lucia, a merchandiser with AGT Foods Canada. Kyle studied business and economics at the University of Regina. Before joining AGT Foods, Kyle performed market research and market development with Saskatchewan Trade and Export Partnership, or STEP. He's been mer merchandising pulses for AGT for more than eight years now and has been involved in marketing pulses from Canada and Australia for the last two years. So welcome presenters. Hi everyone, Are, can you see my um, screen? There, there you go. go. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so hi everyone. It's a great day um, to talk to you about what I joke to be my four, four, favorite four letter F word, FABA. I'm sure some of you are wondering why we call it FABA with a V than FABA with a B. My father-in-law, who also is a farmer, thought we actually misspelt um, our name on our business cards when we very first launched our business. However, there's actually way too many names for faba beans, um, from faba beans, faba beans, to broad beans, horse beans, and tick beans. Very confusing. However, we decided to call it faba with a V, as our goal is to make faba more famous in the North American food market. And when we did market research to food products where most commonly known was fava with a V. So since our end goal is to market to the consumer, we went with fava with a V. Before diving into prairie fava, or before diving into fava, I'd like to take a minute to recognize why prairie fava came into being. Prior to officially launching prairie fava during the years of 2015 and 2016, I conducted market research to see where fava could be a fit and help meet the growing demand for plant-based protein. What I noticed was a few problems. Diversity, 55% of consumers were willing to eat more plant-based foods, but they needed a variety to choose from as part of a diverse and healthy diet. The consumers are looking for healthier options, but 67% say they would eat more plant-based foods if they tasted better. Consumers from the ages of 25 to 35 to 34 buy plant-based foods to align their purchase behavior with their moral ethics regarding environmental impact, and only 25% of consumers actually trust the food system that we're in. I founded Prairie Fava to help contribute to the solution to these problems. Prairie Fava's ingredients add and complement plant-based offerings for all types of protein consumers. Prairie Fava's ingredients can enhance the nutritional profile of a product without compromising on taste or texture and winning over the consumer. Prairie Fava is vertically integrated from fava seed to farm to fork, offering quality traceability and reliability to its customers and end consumers. Fava, as you know, is a high nitrogen fixing crop, which also increases soil health and yield, contributing to a more sustainable earth. So Prairie Fava was founded by my partner, Kale and myself. Kale is a fifth generation farmer, and he also owns a family seed business called Jeffrey Seeds. He had a crop tour in 2015, and farmers were so impressed by the nodules on pharma, or, sorry, fava, that they were hesitant to grow due to a lack of consistency in the market. Kale knew I had a passion for health and sales and thought, hey, why don't you find a market for these beans? And then my farmers will grow more of them. They're healthy for consumers and great for the farmer's soil. 
At that point, I was caregiving for my mom who had cancer and we were trying to get more protein into her diet. I thought if I could only make some of these carbs that she was eating more nutrient dense so they would have more substance for her. When I started looking into fava, the opportunities seemed endless on how favas could be a great addition into the plant-based movement and also be a great addition for some bakery products without affecting the taste. At Prairie Fava, our mission is to bring back the ancient bean and create demand for fava on plates globally. Our vision is to grow and craft functional plant-based fava ingredients for a healthier diet and planet. From the farm to consumer's plates, fava's check all the boxes when it comes to consumer trends. Checking the boxes of consumer trends lends itself directly to fava's versatility, enhanced functionality and exceptional versatility. Our fava ingredients can be seemingly integrated into a diverse range of food application, applications for, for added nutrition and improve, improve functionality without compromising on taste, color, or aroma. As you can see, favas remain one of the most nutrient pulses in plants in the ingredient plant-based market today. Prairie Fava is extremely proud of the farmers that grow our fava beans. With family members that grow fava, we understand how hard farmers work and we want that work to be reflected in the products that our fava is in. Prairie Fava prides itself on selling the whole fava bean, from our whole fava bean to split fava bean to fava flour into various market segments. People ask us, so who does Prairie Fava sell to? Well, right now we do do a lot, um, what we call our bulk market. We do do a bit of exporting specifically to Japan. However, our main focus as an organization is to grow the North American consumer market of fava. We want to make fava more famous across um, consumers' pantries. Focusing on selling more of our fava as ingredients to other food manufacturers, that then you will see fava more, on, more in products in the grocery store. And at some point, we want to have our own brand of consumer products. This has been a work in progress for a while. It has taken me a lot longer than I anticipated, but hopefully by the end of this year and early next year, we will finally be able to share with you a product we are very excited about launching. Just a reminder, Haley, we've got two minutes left here. Problem. We're very happy to have strategic partnerships from our project with Protein Industry Canada and Roquette and um, our other strategic investor, District Ventures Capital. From fava flour to protein isolates, fava is used in all, uh, can be used in ingredients um, to grow in the consumer product market. Much like the products on the screen, we've seen that fava's applications as an ingredient has extreme potential in a variety of food segments. And we do have a few of Prairie Fava's customers launching products in the next quarter that we can't share yet, but are very excited to do some cross promotion with them as their products do launch across the nation. Striving to be a company that is completely vertically integrated from Fava Seed to Fava product, we are proud to have the license of DL Rico, the first of its kind, low visine, low con visine, low tannin. The variety is ideal for our ingredient and end product. I see this variety as a great stepping stone for the industry in the new fava bean variety. And also note, we still have a ways to go on fava agronomics and varieties, but being on the Prairie uh, Recommendation Committee for Pulse and Specialty Crops, I see a lot of great work and excitement from breeders and fava has a bright future. Farmers are key partners for us. Farmers are seeing fava as being part of a healthy crop rotation as favas are the highest nitrogen fixing pulse crop. Fabas, as you know, love moisture and don't do well in areas with higher heat units. They have great lodging resistance and one of the biggest uh, pluses right now is they're not affected by a Phanomyces. The only thing that can be a pain with fava, as mentioned in previous presentations, is ligus bud damage. And when you get fava, you need to get fava in the ground early. So hopefully um, we will see shorter growing seasons with future varieties. As the domestic market continues to demand new plant-based alternatives, Prairie Fava is poised to expand in presence in the domestic consumer market. Our goal remains to reintroduce an ancient bean to the modern food movement. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen about all things Fava, and I hope it got you excited about the future Fava has. Thank you. Okay, um, uh, ready to roll here? Okay, um, thank you so much for this opportunity to present. Uh, I'm Brad Gowdy with Fava Canada. Um, I have a lot of information. I'll try to uh, get you through in eight minutes here. 
I wanted to talk about uh, Faba Bean Market Outlook for 2021 and beyond. And I'll talk a little bit about historical markets, uh, some new markets, and also an important new variety type. So uh, just to start off, um, I really believe from what I've seen over the last number of years that Fabas grow best in the black and gray soil zones. Uh, as, as was already stated, Fabas need lots of moisture and cooler conditions. Uh, good quality beans can be grown in the brown zones, but generally they're lower yielding because of the lack of moisture. Uh, in the north, we see good yields, but often quality issues. Uh, the historical faba markets in Canada up to this point have been mainly Egypt for the whole bean food market and also for hog feed. The Egyptian market uh, has a very high spec standard and it's very easy to miss that spec if grown in the north because of frost issues, ligus bugs, um, and a few other things. The Egyptians prefer the, the tannin varieties and so uh, the market for snowbirds is limited. Um, and really the Egyptians have no interest in any other zero tannin varieties. It's really just snowbirds or nothing on the zero tannins. And I really believe that Egypt is Australia's market, not ours. Um, we generally only have access to Egypt if Australia or Europe has had or has production issues. And that's been the case um, over the last few years up until 2020. And uh, this past year, Australia had a very good uh, crop and uh, also with some diminished uh, demand because of COVID, uh, very few faba beans went from Canada to Egypt. Uh, as far as the hog feed market goes, uh, they will not accept high tannin beans. So there's a bit of a conflict here um, because hogs don't like the bitter taste. Uh, not all tannin beans are high in tannin, but uh, but some are, are very bitter. And this is why 90% of the acres in Canada right now are snowbirds and snowdrops. Um, usually the hog feed market is not a great price compared to often what we see for, uh, for the Egyptian market or also for uh, some fractionation uh, market right now. But uh, it still can be profitable if your yield is high enough. And this year, uh, we've actually seen very high hog feed prices, uh, making it a very profitable crop even that way. Um, and I'm also working on developing some feed export markets that uh, should keep a, a fairly healthy floor price on the feed side. Um, I believe it's very risky to grow high, high tannin varieties in Canada, uh, especially in the north, because of the high likelihood of missing export spec. And I get lots of calls every year from guys who've grown some of the high tannin beans, uh, didn't make export quality, and then they, uh, they have a very difficult time moving those beans as feed. Um, although, uh, fortunately, we're seeing some, uh, some recent feeding trials that are initially showing that the frost-damaged beans are as good or better for feed than the light ones. I haven't seen too many natural samples that look like the uh, the sample on the left there. I think that's actually a color sorted sample. Um, the The sample on the right is um, not uncommon to see uh, when growing beans in the north. Uh, usually it's somewhere in between those two. Um, as far as markets go, looking ahead, I really believe the future of faba beans in Canada is fractionation for plant-based protein. And if you're not familiar with that word fractionation, this is a, an illustration from Mark Olson, uh, with, uh, formerly with the government of Alberta. So you take your whole seed, you dehull it, and your hulls are mainly fiber. Your split seed then gets ground into such a fine powder that you can separate a lot of the starch uh, particles from the protein particles. And so then you have basically what we call three fractions. And so um, the fractionation world, it's really all about two factors, where before we were more concerned about um, trying to make export spec to get into Egypt, which was very difficult. Now the two important factors for plant-based protein extraction or fractionation are number one, maximizing protein. And I know uh, Kara, Kara talked about um, 
sulfur not necessarily increasing our yields, but it, we have seen um, uh, a lot of situations where elemental sulfur can uh, help with uh, raising your protein levels. And also um, embracing the new low visine, con visine varieties. Uh, why low, low visine, con visine? Well, uh, those are anti nutritional properties that occur naturally in faba beans. And uh, it was, as was stated before, these properties are linked to a very, to a rare but potentially serious health issue called fabism, uh, basically named after faba beans or faba beans, faba beans. And uh, several large food companies will not use faba protein or flour because of this health risk. Just to remind uh, we've got two minutes left here. Thank you. Um, and I, I, as was stated before, the switchover can't be done gradually because of the profuse cross-pollination of fabas. And so I, I believe it will take a very large wholesale adoption to avoid contamination. So um, we will have enough seed in place for 100,000 acres for 2022. Uh, with our new variety um, that we're working in conjunction with DL Seeds and um, SeedNet called Fabels. So Fabels are a tannin variety, but they're very low in tannin and they're low in, in visine, con visine. And I really believe that uh, it, would, it would do Canada very well to rebrand Fabas, just like we did from rapeseed to canola. And uh, what we're going to informally call these Fabels is polar beans. Uh, Parkland developed zero or O for zero GMO, zero soy, L for low tannin, and especially low visine, con visine and amino acid rich or high in protein. Um, Fabels were a bit of a concern. This is just a little uh, plot that I did uh, in, in uh, our garden here. Snowbirds on the left, Fabels on the right. And you can see that they did seem a lot more than one day later to maturity. But the interesting part is when they were combined, not just in that plot, but in the field, we saw very little frost damage in the Fabels. And so I think, uh, I think it is still a very workable variety. The advantages of Fabels are especially the low visine, con visine for protein and flour. Uh, they are higher yielding than snowbirds. We will get a premium in the Egyptian market for them and we see very little black frost damage. Now, even though they're a, a tannin variety, they're very low in tannin and some initial animal feeding trials have showed actually better weight gain in hogs and poultry, and the disadvantage slightly longer days to maturity. Market opportunities for faba bean protein, and I really believe that the that the ceiling for snowbirds is about 100,000 acres, and the floor for low visine varieties like uh, Fabel is 100,000 acres. So I believe there's real opportunity for us to grow this. There is great demand for faba protein in the meat alternative industry. I've met with both Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods, but there's also demand from conventional companies to replace soy in conventional foods. I've also met with several of those companies. So this is just a shot of our new facility uh, near Legal, Alberta, where we will be uh, doing fra fractionation in the very near future, and we should have um, uh, contracts, uh, production contracts for next year. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brad. All right, so my name is Kyle Lucia. I'm with AGT Foods. I'm a merchandiser here in Regina. Uh, I'm gonna go over a few things here today, uh, but I've mar been marketing a lot of the faba beans our company's been doing from Canada and, and now from Australia as well. Uh, so just a quick overview of what we're gonna do. I'm just gonna introduce AGT if anybody's not familiar with us and what we're doing and some of the things we've done recently. Um, our activity in the faba bean market, how these faba beans are consumed, and what global markets uh, are actively playing in this. I'll take a look at some of the production outlook that we've seen globally and, uh, and some of those market quality expectations that Brad was mentioning about. Uh, and then also discuss a bit of the market challenges and considerations and some of the future potential that we're seeing at AGT. So I'll go over really quickly with AGT. I won't uh, take too much of your time on this, but the company was founded in 2001 uh, is primarily a pulses and specialty crops company. Uh, we expanded to 22 locations and we're headquartered uh, as a global company now in Regina. Um, the global company is really 
expanded to value-added processing in the in USA, South Africa, India, Turkey, Australia, with merchandising and distribution uh, divisions in the UK, Europe, China, Myanmar, and Eastern USA and Canada on the retail sides of things. Um, in 2019, HET became a private company uh, with Fairfax Holdings uh, being the majority uh, majority owner, along with North Point Capital and AGT Management. Um, and this Fairfax group has many household brands that you would know from Bauer to Golf Town to a, a wide range of them there just listed, just for your understanding. Uh, so in that growth and that in expansion, uh, Canada, or AGT has expanded its, its group of product offerings and some of the investments it's made uh, to cereals and oil seeds, uh, soybeans and faba beans as well. Uh, and some of those investments include uh, the investment in the Big Sky and Last Mountain Railway, uh, which is feeding a large uh, program that we're doing for our bulk vessel program. Uh, in addition to that investment, we've also invested in a large high throughput uh, cleaning facility in Delisle, Saskatchewan, just west of uh, Saskatoon. Uh, this is a site that can do 15,000 metric tons of high efficiency cleaning in just a 16 hour day. Uh, in addition to that, we've also invested in a partnership at the Vancouver term, Port, of, uh, Port of Vancouver, uh, a bulk vessel terminal. And uh, this is a program that will be up, up and running again uh, in the new year. Uh, in addition to that investment, we've become the largest, uh, or operating the largest privately owned uh, intermodal terminal. Uh, and that's located right next to our factory here in Regina. And then in 2014, another investment that we made uh, on the value add, focus of AGT is, is a company in Laval, Quebec, which does canning and small packaging. So not only, I'll get into this later, but uh, some of the things and how we're active into it, but those are some of the investments that we've made. A big one that we will also reference to is AGT made a large investment in 2013 to be a, a major player in the food ingredients division with commissioning a, a factory in Minot, North Dakota. Uh, this site is, is, is fractionizing uh, peas, lentils, chickpeas, and now in a big way, faba beans. Uh, it's 120,000 ton produ uh, production capacity per year and uh, a big, big proponent of, of uh, future growth for, for faba bean consumption in North America. So AGT's activity in the faba bean market, uh, we've become a, a trusted uh, global supplier of, of faba beans, traditional uh, commodity markets and value added markets. Uh, we're offering faba beans from Australia, Canada, uh, the other European origins, uh, as well as the UK. We're, we're splitting them. We're also selling them whole in bulk and in, in value-added process. Uh, we're actively purchasing uh, a wide variety of Canadian varieties. That includes the 9-4 variety, which we invested in, in the seed program at the initial stages, uh, which we've had great success with. Uh, the Snowbird variety we've, we've worked with quite extensively and are, and are also working quite actively in the Fibel and to a lesser extent, Tabasco, Florent and Snowdrop, but that is something that we would uh, we would be active in uh, when circumstances are right. Uh, we're also, as mentioned with the that company that we've purchased, uh, AGD Retail Click, uh, we are also canning faba beans ourselves and selling those in retail markets, and then also small package in them as well. And then also as well, in the uh, the food ingredients division, so we're doing the proteins, the flours, and the texturized proteins uh, in a in a larger way. So just to talk a little bit about how these beans are consumed, so you're understanding where your beans are going, how they're being consumed. It gives you an understanding as to what you're kind of targeting and shooting for. And there's been some talk about um, about achieving uh, some of those higher val higher qualities for um, uh, your faba beans to get the best price on the market you can get for uh, in some of those human consumption markets. So the first one is, is a Bisra. It's kind of like a hummus. Uh, it's eaten in throughout the Middle East, but particu particularly, particularly in Egypt. Uh, it's more or less uh, in some ways a hummus and in some ways a soup, but it's, it's eaten widespread uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout Egypt. Uh, fried faba bean snacks and also broad beans uh, as well, but faba beans are also actively consumed. This is very popular in Asia, uh, in the Pacific Ring, and then Southern Europe and Mediterranean regions. Uh, a big one is the falafel market. This is the hamburger of the Middle East. Uh, when I see put a mean, I'm referring to Middle East, North Africa region. This is consumed daily. It's a very popular dish. Uh, it is a meat replacement and it's approximately 50% of 
uh, total consumption in Egypt um, and is a, has a major industry following in Egypt. There's a lot of factories dedicated towards this. The primary one that a lot of people are, are chasing for the human consumption market is the Fulmadamus market. Now, this is a national dish in Egypt. Uh, if you're going to visit the pyramids, you're probably going to be encouraged by your travel guide to, to try this at some point. Uh, it is the Cheerios of Egypt, uh, and it's consumed quite extensively. Majority of the population, upwards of 90% of the population, would consume this on a daily basis. And it's for breakfast. It's similar to a chili, but uh, these are the ones that people are targeting for that high quality uh, consumption market that we've we've had good success with with the 9-4. Just for a while, we've got one minute left. Sorry. Great. All right. Um, so faba bean consumption also is fish foods. Um, the MENA region is uh, the primary consumer of it. Um, majority of it going to Egypt, but it's going to the surrounding markets as well. The market supply for these things uh, is Australia, United Kingdom, and the Baltic region. France is in the last few years has been stepping out of the market uh, purely because they just can't achieve the qualities. Um, this is a chart that's basically going to show you a, a quick summary of, of the quality expectations. Now, less marketable options at the bottom. Because we're a value-added company, we are working with these quite actively. So don't ever just rule them out to the feed market. It's something that we can work with pretty well, uh, pretty extensively. Um, some future outlooks for these are, are considerations. Um, with Brexit happening, uh, the EU standard or the EU subsidies are not certain. France is declining standards because of environmental rules. Germany and Sweden aren't in the market. Snowbird does have potential, but when the market has uh, interest in, and ability for it, and the can of varieties, they are consumed in Australia uh, widely in the feed markets there. So from our side, future demand, we kind of see the surge in the fabric being demand in the extruded snacks, meat analogs, which are plant-based meats, and dairy replacements in the food ingredients division. Canada establishing itself as it has as a, as a quality and reliable, reliable fo uh, focused uh, option for as it has as lentils and peas. If it establishes itself as that on fab beans, it'll have just as much success in my belief. We, we ship a lot of lentils and a lot of different pulses to Egypt. And the growing population of the MENA region is, is something that can help be another dr demand driver uh, for, for faba beans in our view in the future. Um, just quickly, if, if anybody is looking to market their faba beans uh, currently or is looking for seed for next year or is looking for next year's contracts, these are some of the people that we can get in contact. If you have any further questions about the market, I'm happy to answer any of them. Um, and with that, thank you, Corey. Thank you, Haley. Thank you, Brad. And thank you, everybody at Saskatchewan Pulse Growers for putting this on today. Super. Thanks to all our presenters. Uh, Haley, Brad, and Kyle gives us a glimpse into the work you're doing in, in faba bean market development. It's a, it's a long game. It takes a while. We, we recognize that, but it, it, there's some exciting opportunities coming, so that's great. We're now going to spend the rest of our time in a question and answer panel discussion, and uh, I'd like to welcome two of the, the most well-respected agrologists in the province and, and, and the prairies, Sherry Lynn Phelps is our agronomy manager at SAS Pulse Growers, and Lyle Cowell is, uh, works with Nutrien in the Northeast. And uh, glad to have both of you here today. And if you want to handle the, the question and answer period, that's great. So over to you, Sherry Lynn. So th thanks, uh, Lyle, for joining here today on the question and answer period. Um, we also have everyone else that was part of the um, presentations today that will be on the question and answer so there will be questions sort of for everybody um, and I'll ask Kara and Anand as well um, to be part of this as, as the agronomy sort of panel here is going to get the, the first questions um, we'll give everybody else a, a little bit of a break so the first question that's that's going to go to Kara and uh, Lyle is um, inoculating favas. So we talk, you talked about um, the benefit of, of the nitrogen fixation with the favas. Any um, benefit to double inoculating favas? Have you seen any sort of um, practices that could improve the nodulation 
um, looking at you know seed plus granular possibilities or are they fairly good nodulators to start with and I'll give you guys both a chance to answer that so Lyle would you like to go first I was hoping Kara would but not sure <laughs> um, I guess no to be honest uh, uh, been reasonably successfully inoculated by the same rhizobi as P. Um, we tend to see quite a bit of natural inoculation, I think, uh, from from residual rhizobi in the soil. Um, I, I honestly have not had a customer try double inoculate. Perhaps it'd be of value, but in the end, I have never seen unsuccessful uh, inoculation of a faba bean crop. They form wonderful nod nodules, actually. Thanks, Lyle. Kara? Uh, I tend to agree with Lyle. Uh, I personally haven't seen any or had any experience uh, double inoculating. Uh, done that on the soybean side of things, but not on the faba bean side. We've had really good luck just using a single application and like uh, Lyle said, just really heavy, good nodules forming on our fabas. So. Great. Um, Another question that's sort of related to the nodulation and nitrogen fixation is what is your experience with nitrogen credit that you would give to the crops following fabus? You mentioned that um, you know yields have increased in the crops following fabus. How do you adjust the nutrients going into those crops? This time we'll start with Kara. <laughs> Yeah, it's a really interesting one, I think. Um, going into the year following Fabas, I would say, you know, maybe I would adjust for maybe 10 to 15 pounds, but I do feel like in that year two soil test, we're seeing upwards of 30 pounds of nitrogen, uh, you know, when we're testing the soil and just that extra release coming in that second year. So I'm not sure if that's just from that heavier plant mass breaking down then, but uh, we're really seeing that bang for our buck in that second the year, two years out from growing our fabas. Okay. Lyle? I guess my two cents would be uh, a bit like we did over the years with peas, with the assumption that yields are going to be better after a pulse crop and there's a nitrogen benefit it's not gigantic but a nitrogen benefit from the pulse crop um, be it peas or fava beans but you also have an assumption that you will probably grow more crops so the crop will just utilize that in so I, I don't know if there's a benefit but i don't know if that means a benefit that means reduce your end rate very often uh, it, there was some recent work from Diane Knight at the U of S to you know, confirm that your removal rate of N from fava beans is also very high because they're very high protein crops. So it's, I don't think you're going to eliminate nitrogen fertilizer by growing fava beans, I guess is my message. Thank you guys. Um, switching gears a little bit and we're going to talk, uh, there's a question regarding herbicides and residual herbicides particularly. So the question is, is there any concern with residual herbicides in crops prior to faba beans? I guess in other words, is there certain stubbles and, and um, herbicides that growers should be concerned about when they're planning on where to put the faba beans? And if so, what was the injury and was there any yield loss associated with it? So Lyle, you get to go first this time. Actually, if you don't mind, uh, Carrie mentioned it that the issue in your slideshow so maybe i'll let you go first <laughs> all right well typically i'm trying to grow the fabs or we're trying to choose a field where we have really no concern with any residual product i guess i'll stay out so i don't i haven't personally tested uh any or have any hands-on experience with growing fabas per se on everest treated ground or uh, clopyrrolid treated ground in the northeast um, we typically run it can run into some issues I know with our pulse crops and stuff but I would tend to stay away from those um, I once again I have not seen any specific injury but I'm staying on the conservative or safe side and uh, just trying to look at uh, products or, or plant fabs on field without a, any residual past from the year prior uh, and I did see uh, one field last summer with 
uh, very significant damage from uh, carryover clip virulent. Uh, you got to keep in mind these are pretty long season crops too. So even if you delay the maturity because of a residue, that then that can lead to some pretty big problems in grading and frost yield loss as well. So do your best to avoid those residues in the end. Uh, next question, we're going to switch gears again and, and go back to diseases. Shaman did a great job of laying out diseases and, and lots that we don't really know yet regarding faba beans. Um, what experience as agronomists do the two of you have in terms of the benefits of using fungicides? Have you seen the impact on yields protecting the crop or where I guess the disease has really affected yields? We've got a standoff now. <laughs> <laughs> Lyle, would you like to go first? <laughs> well, it, it, it's it's been variable. Uh, fungicides haven't been any; they haven't been a miracle in preventing disease. Uh, and I don't know what the real solution will be. Uh, rotation, rotation certainly, and but uh, fungicides have been a benefit uh, in many cases, but they're not always a benefit either. And uh, we. We tried some little trials last summer, and uh, it didn't produce the benefits I guess that I was hoping for. And, and maybe that's because we're not giving you a good enough understanding on timing for the range of diseases. So in my mind, it's always about botrytis, but maybe maybe that's part of our sometimes lack of success on controlling making those leaves look perfect. In the end, the right weather is going to help us more than anything. Uh, but I wouldn't. But still, fungicides have been a benefit often enough that I think they're worthwhile considering. Kara, would you like to add to that? I think I'm just trying to continually learn from my field experience out there with them. I know every year we have some sort of black spots on our leaves and uh, we want to identify them properly and then address them as need be. Um, with my hailed fabas last year, we did some strip trials in there after the fact to see if we could get any kind of response. But uh, unfortunately, uh, we didn't see anything in that case. It was just more of a trial and error thing there. But again, like Lyle said, um, I think we're watching, trying to understand these diseases, the timings of them, uh, where where we could may maybe possibly try some of these products and hopefully end up with a yield uh, benefit from them. Thank you. I see Shama had jumped on, um, so I'm going to ask her to jump back on here. Um, as we're talking about disease and fungicide strategies, um, would you like to comment on, you know, the existing fungicides that we do have and realistically can we expect them to be controlling, you know, the diseases that you talked about today? Yeah, that's a really good question. Sorry, I heard disease, I got excited. I was like, oh, it's for me. <laughs> Jumped on. Um, yeah, you know, like the fungicides that we have registered are on faba beans are really all for suppression of white mold, which like I said, we really don't see white mold as, as being a huge problem. Um, you know, and the interesting thing is, is that in, in terms of other botrytis and other crops, it's not a huge problem. So we don't see a lot of fungicides that are registered specifically for botrytis. Uh, same with Stemphilium and Alternaria. Uh, I know in Australia, what they generally use for chocolate spot is Mancozeb, and that's like one of the oldest fungicides that people tend not to use anymore because it's not one of the new fancy ones, right? But I don't know if anyone's using it or how much kind of research has been done here in Canada on kind of bringing that fungicide back. Um, and I don't, I don't even think when Robin did her fungicide trial, I don't know if Mancoseb was even included in there. Um, and so, yeah, you know, a lot of what I look at for disease comes from Australia and they tend to use some of the older fungicides, whereas we're always trying to use the, uh, like I think Kara was saying, like Miravis Ace and even Lance, I think, you know, so we're trying to use the, the newer, more exotic fungicides. Yeah. Thank you. Lyle or Kara, do you guys have anything else to add to that? I don't think I do, no. 
No, I think it's interesting. I think we're trying to figure that one out as we go and see if we can find something that would work. Yes, agreed, agreed. So I guess on the disease side of things too, um, questions related to more the disease levels on seed. Um, so what would be thresholds to be considered of some of these diseases on seed and are there seed treatments that can help? Good, no, all these are all really good questions. I feel like a lot of them, we don't know yet. Um, so I think I mentioned, you know, the threshold for botrytis is 10% infection. Um, having said that, you know, most of the inoculum for chocolate spot or botrytis disease issues comes from stubble, not necessarily from seed, but you want to keep those thresholds below 10%. Um, in terms of alternaria and trampillium, there is no information on that at all. You know, it's interesting, like I said, you look at situations like Australia, stemphilium and alternaria are considered minor diseases. I get, you know, a little blip and say, oh, generally don't worry about them. So it's interesting that that's what we're seeing come up as a problem and there's very little information on there. So it's like we have to start from scratch. Um, in terms of seed treatments, um, since none are registered and I'm a government professional, I will not comment on that, but leave it to the agronomist to comment on that. Yeah. Well, or Kara, have you guys run into any, you know, issues on seed with higher levels that, you know, where seed treatments have worked? Or what is your strategy for seed treatments, I guess, with FABIS? It gets to be a bit of a tough one. It's, it's, uh, they're big seed at a high seeding rate and, it gets, you know, it gets to be pretty expensive to, to treat FABA bean seed. So there's actually, I would say, uh, Perry, you can tell me, but I, I there's a lot. There's I would say the most on the ground without seed treatment, and the focus would rather be do you know, on other inputs. I guess you know, the foliar fungicide maybe than the seed applied fungicide might be the better dollar spent when when you look at the cost. So I guess I can I really honestly I can contribute no experience nor advice. <laughs> Kara, do you have further thoughts? Uh, no, I agree with Lyle. Most of my seed that has gone in the ground to date has been bare seed. Um, in doing some research and looking um, into different things, and especially the comment or finding the stemphilium and alternaria, it makes me curious and want to maybe uh, test my growers on what the levels are in their seed and, you know, go down that path and and doing some strips or doing something with that um, just to try to understand more. But uh, like Lyle said, you know, typically we've been trying to approach it, you know, with good quality seed using. Um, I feel like germ has been one of the higher concerns with uh, faba beans is sometimes uh, they the germ has been a little lower than maybe other crops going into the ground. So that's been uh, of concern as well, so. Okay. Well, can thank I you guys. A, can, I, can I, as a panelist, can I ask a question? Sure, <laughs> <laughs> we'll allow answer. you to. <laughs> There's some pretty nasty looking ligus damaged baba beans in, in bins right now that some will probably be seed. Uh, is there any, do you think there's any risk to ligus damaged seed being used as a seed source? I'll pose that to Shama. I'm, I'm thinking you're, you're thinking from a disease perspective, Lyle? I guess as a disease, they're, they're, they always look so black looking, whether whatever that's causing that black look to the seed because where the ligus have, been, have uh, penetrated the seed coats, I, is that, could that lead uh, to more seedling disease or disease even later in the year? I, I guess that's a sham. <laughs> yeah, and I could try to answer that because actually, um, you know, when I said we had done a bit of research in 2015 and 2016, it was with that exact question in mind, is the ligus damage making diseases worse because we see it, you know, as potentially an entry point for some of these pathogens. Um, interestingly, we really didn't find any uh, interaction at all between uh, ligus, even like the little the little pinpoints that you see on the seed. We tried to inoculate them with some of these like botrytis pathogens, and we really didn't see 
much happening. It's like Botrytis on its own can cause some damage to the seeds and Ligus on its own causes damage to the seed, but there doesn't seem to be an interaction. Um, we didn't go further though and look at whether there was germination issues on these Ligus damaged seeds. There was on the Botrytis damaged seeds, but we didn't plant the Ligus damaged seeds because I'm a pathologist. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would think, you know, from an insect perspective, the mechanical damage that the insect, you know, sucking may cause on the, the seed could could impact the germination, but a good germination test would be able to give you that. The one advantage I guess fabs have over some other crops like soybean or dry bean is the, the cotyledons remain below ground, so you're not relying on those to get above ground and 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 help with the, the emergence of the crop as much. They're more of a food source as the plant is, is germinating. So um, it's a great question though. And I don't think anybody's really looked into it because we've seen a lot of ligus damage in the last year or two. So one, one last question I have for you as we're getting close to the end of our discussion here, and we've got lots of questions and I am not gonna get through all of them. So we will be sending the questions out to people and, and uh, having the answers posted um, to the audience here at a later date. So I'm gonna go back to just fertility and talk about seed placed phosphorus because you talked Kara talked about you know needing to get a lot of phosphorus down um is there any disadvantages to placing all the phosphorus in the side row or mid row band and how tolerant are our fab is to seed placed phosphorus start with me sure. um <laughs> we've had um so I guess lots of things, lots of parameters here to go about, you know, whether what your type of drill is, what your opener is on. Um, typically, you know, up here or across the province, we've got guys seeding three quarter inch uh, knives in their Burgos or maybe their seed hawks or something or, or uh, Morris's putting that fertilizer down below. Um, in my, example I was using and I probably should have been a little bit more specific it was uh, with a grower with a with a Morris or a, a seed hawk type configuration so that uh, the fertilizer was with or below um, and so in our heavier soils higher moisture we've been able to go at those higher rates um, without any seed injury or concern um, so that's been helping uh, address kind of go a little higher than maybe normal or higher than expected levels when it comes to FOSS. Lyle, would you like to follow that up? I don't know if I had a lot to add. Uh, I've never seen any suspicion of uh, seed row place phosphorus and damage to faba bean. Um, they, I think we know they have reasonable tolerance to seed place, seed place fertilizer. Uh, Really, this falls into a, the broader the broader topic of maybe we don't we just don't completely understand what the seed rate what the safe rates of seed row fertilizer should be for any crop. There was part of the question though was uh, would it be okay to put all your phosphorus in the mid row? Um, and I would always discourage that. Uh, I would always encourage a farmer to at least put 15 or 20 pounds of phosphorus in the seed row if not more. And if they want to put some phosphorus in the mid row, that's fine. But uh, first focus needs to be some in, some in or near the seed row. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you all for being part of the panel and, and being part of the pre presentations today. Like I said, there is a lot, lot more questions that are unanswered and some questions for the other presenters as well. So expect to see those questions and answers come out at a later date. So with that, I'll turn it back to Corey. Thank you, panelists, uh, for answering questions. And uh, as, you, as you said, Sherilyn, there'll be some more to follow up on, which is, which is fine. Glad to see, see engagement. So thanks to all the presenters today for uh, sharing your expertise and, and some of the exciting things about Faba beans or Faba beans. Um, thanks to Faba Canada for sponsoring today's session. And then I also mentioned that Pulse Canada Faba Beans survey that they'd like some grower input on, and that will be linked to today's email. Next week is the final installment in these premier Pulse virtual sessions. 
um, and it's focusing on lentils, lentil production, weed, weed management, crop rotation, seeding rate, and of course, disease management. If you haven't registered and would like to, uh, check out the, the SAS Pulse uh, website for, to do that or, or find SAS Pulse on Twitter. So that's all for today. Uh, thanks so much for joining us and uh, have a great day, everyone.